Imagine a square with side lengths 1. What's its area? It's pretty simple, it's just 1. 1 unit squared. Now how about a circle of radius 1? Well, the area of a circle is just pi r squared, so that's just pi or about 3.14 units squared. And when we say unit squared, it's like how many squares of length 1 can fit inside of our area. For example, about 3.14 squares of length 1 can fit inside a circle. Thus, the problem of finding the area of some closed planar shape is called quadrature or squaring. Now, we can square the circle, triangle, regular polygons, whatever, pretty easily with simple formulas, but what if we wanted to square a graph? Like a parabola, for example. What do we do? Well, if you know calculus, you just find the integral of whatever function we want to square. But what if we didn't know calculus? Like Pierre de Fermat, who wrestled with a similar question before the days of Newton and Leibniz. Specifically, he wanted to find a solution for the quadrature of curves y equals x to the n, where n is a positive integer. Let's say we want to find the area below x to the n from x equals 0 to x equals a, for some constant a. We can divide up this interval from 0 to a into further sub-intervals, but with an interesting pattern. Let's label the points dividing the intervals with letters. Now, the sub-interval from 0 to n is just the entire interval from 0 to a, so it's length a. Then, starting from n and working right to left, each successive subinterval will form a decreasing geometric progression. So, OM will be a times r, where r is our common ratio, and r is less than 1. Then OL will be ar squared, then OK is a r cubed, and so on and so forth. Now, we can draw rectangles that reach to the height of the graph at the rightmost point of each subinterval. Notice that the height of the graph at each point is just its distance from O to whatever point to the nth power. So at the point n, the height is a to the n, and at m, it's a r to the n, and at l, it's a r squared to the n, and so on. Now, we can find the area of any rectangle we desire. For example, the rectangle between m and m has base length a minus a r and height a to the n. Let's simplify that area to a to the n times a times 1 minus r, or a to the n plus 1 times 1 minus r. From there, we can use the summation formula for an infinite geometric series to add up our infinite number of rectangles. An infinite geometric sequence with initial value a and common ratio r is simply a over 1 minus r. Now, our initial value is the area of the first rectangle, a to the n plus 1 times 1 minus r. So then, what's our common ratio between the rectangles? Well, let's look at the next rectangle, between l and m. The base is ar minus ar squared, or ar times 1 minus r. The height is ar to the n. Multiplying everything, we get ar to the n plus 1 times 1 minus r. The ratio between this and our previous expression is just r to the n plus 1, which is the common ratio we're looking for. We can actually see that for each successive rectangle, the length of the rectangle is multiplied by r, and the height of the rectangle is multiplied by r to the n which results in an overall ratio of r to the n plus 1. So, plugging all this into our formula, we get that the sum of the area of all our rectangles, let's say s sub r, is a to the n plus 1 times 1 minus r, all over 1 minus r to the n plus 1. Notice that the actual area of all our rectangles depend on our choice of r. And here's the key. The closer our r is to 1, which makes the rectangles thinner, the more accurate the infinite sum of rectangles get to the actual area under our graph. But here's the issue. When we take the limit as r goes to 1, we get a to the n plus 1 times 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1 to the n plus 1, which just becomes an indeterminate 0 over 0. Except, well, look at the denominator of our equation, 1 minus r to the n plus 1. This can easily be simplified to 1 minus r times 1 plus r plus r squared plus all the way to r to the n. You can see that when we distribute, all the terms cancel out except for 1 and negative r to the n plus 1. And so we can cancel out the 1 minus r from the numerator and the denominator and get a sub r is equal to a to the n plus 1 over 1 plus r squared plus r cubed all the way to r to the n. Now, we can easily take the limit as r goes to 1 and we get a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. 
Now, a is some chosen constant for our variable x, so if you want a formula for a general function, we get x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, the antiderivative of x to the n. a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 is just the integral from 0 to a of x to the n dx. Again, I want to stress that this was found before calculus was a thing, before derivatives and integrals and the fundamental theorem of calculus. But this was an amazing discovery. It solves the quadrature problem for any function, x to the n. To Fermat's delight, it worked for negative and even rational exponents. Except for one case, the hyperbola. This is a graph of the function, f of x is equal to 1 over x, or x to the negative 1. But if we use our formula, we end up dividing by 0, x to the 0 over 0. This is confusing, it's not downright frustrating. What's so special about this one graph? Well, let's see what happens if we do our rectangle geometric progression method on the hyperbola. Just like we did before, we label subintervals that form a geometric progression. And this time, the height of each point would be the distance to the negative first power. So the height at n would be a to the negative 1, or 1 over a. The height at m would be 1 over a r. At l, it's 1 over a r squared, and so on. Now, the widths of the rectangles are the same as last time. Rectangle mn has width a minus a r, or a to the 1 minus r. Rectangle lm has width a r minus a r squared, or a r times 1 minus r, and so on. What happens when we find the area? Surprisingly, we get that the area of each and every rectangle is the same, just 1 minus r. What does this mean? It means that as the distance from 0 grows geometrically, since that's how our rectangle's widths are defined, our area grows arithmetically, in equal increments. And this property stays as r goes to 1, and as we approach our perfect hyperbola. But how can we describe inputs that change geometrically, but outputs that change arithmetically? logarithms. As the inputs of a logarithmic function grows geometrically, the outputs of the function increases arithmetically. For example, the common log of 1 is 1, common log of 10 is 2, and the common log of 100 is 3, and so on. So the function we're looking for, the integral of a hyperbola, it's a logarithmic function. But what base do we use? Well, just like how pi stems from the relationship between a circle's radius and circumference, we find a number that stems from the logarithmic relationship between the hyperbola and its area. This base, some natural base, is in fact E. And thus the surprising and beautiful answer to the area under a hyperbola is a natural logarithm. The antiderivative of 1 over x is simply ln of x. But why? The one missing piece to the quadrature problem, an innately geometric problem, is solved by a number most frequently associated with calculus. To find the answer, we finally have to dig into the foundations of calculus. The interesting thing is, though, one may argue that it's not E that defines the integral of a hyperbola, but rather the integral of the hyperbola defines E. For example, one can define E as the constant, such that the area between the hyperbola 1 over x, the x-axis, x equals 1, and x equals E, is equal to exactly 1. In this sense, E comes from the hyperbola, but as it is often in math, connections can go both ways. Let's use E, for the sake of this video, as the base of an exponential function e to the x, such that it is its own derivative. This of course is an incredible and valuable statement, but an explanation requires a full separate video, and thus we will continue taking this knowledge for granted. Now, if we wanted to find the inverse function of y equals e to the x, we can switch the variables and solve for y. Thus, we get x equals e to the y. And by the rule of logarithms, we can take log base e to both sides to get y equals ln of x. So unsurprisingly, e to the x and ln of x are inverse functions. But what can we do with this information? Well, let's just take any two inverse functions, y equals f of x and x equals inverse f of y, such that y equals f inverse f of y. Let's notate their derivatives in Leibniz notation, so we get dfx over dx is equal to dy over dx, and d inverse f of y, dy is dx over dy. We can see that the derivatives are reciprocals of one another. dy over dx is equal to 1 over dx over dy. If we wanted to prove this algebraically, we can use the chain rule for y equals f inverse f of y to get 1 equals d inverse f of y over dy times 
df inverse f of y over d inverse f of y, which results in 1 equals d inverse f of y over dy times dfx dx, or finally, 1 equals dx over dy times dy over dx, meaning dx dy and dy dx are reciprocals. We can apply this idea to the fact that e to dx and ln of x are inverse functions. If we have y equals e to dx and x equals ln of y, we have dy over dx is equal to e to the x because e to the x is its own derivative. Thus, dx over dy, or the derivative of ln of y, is 1 over e to the x. But since e to the x is y, we have the derivative of ln of y as just 1 over y. We can now interchange letters to d over dx, ln of x is equal to 1 over x. This also means that ln of x is the antiderivative of 1 over x. But by the fundamental theorem of calculus, the definite integral of 1 over x between two points can be represented as a difference of the antiderivative functions at those points. So, if we just want the area under the hyperbola between 1 and e, we can calculate ln of e minus ln of 1, which is just 1. And thus, we can find the naturality of ln of x hiding under the area of a hyperbola.